The Cyrex 5X86 is one of the fastest CPUs you can get for the Socket 3 platform. My models are rated for 100MHz, but there were faster versions with 120MHz available as well. So why is this chip labeled as 5x86 intended to be used in Socket 3 motherboards, which are compatible with 486 CPUs? The Cyrex 5x86 is based on a scaled-down version of the M1 core, which was used in the 6x86 for the Socket 7 platform. Based on information found on Wikipedia, the 5x86 achieves 80% of the original core's performance, but at half the transistor count. I got those two CPUs in a bundle with slightly bent pins. And although this seems to be an easy task this time, we still have to make sure both CPUs will fall into the socket like brand new ones. I also happen to have an original heatsink for one of them. Once I find a good thermal tape, I will create a complete version of this CPU. But the CPU is not the only component we are going to change today. When I tested the Intel DX2 CPUs, I used an S3 Verge DX with 4MB of memory. We will replace this card with a Tsang ET6000, which is currently equipped with 2MB only. But we will upgrade it to 4MB by adding sockets for an additional 2MB of MD memory. The Tsang ET6000 was released in November 1995 while the Verge DX was released one year later, in November 1996. So wouldn't this be a downgrade? Unfortunately, I cannot answer this question today, nor would I be able to back up my answer with numbers, because I have not benchmarked those cards yet. But I am planning to test video cards and assess their performance in a future video. So why did I change the graphics card? This is footage taken from the S3 Verge DX with increased gamma settings. The image quality is very poor and it increased the size of the footage I captured. And this is the footage from the Tsang ET6000, also with an increased gamma setting. You can see the lighter grey screen when we switch from the graphics card BIOS message to the system BIOS. Those are about the same color. As you can see, the Tsang card delivers exceptional image quality, much cleaner than the S3 Verge DX. And that was the reason why I decided to change the card. But there are two things we need to take care of before we can use the Tsang ET6000. First, there is a small issue with one of the pins on the graphics chip. Luckily, we have repaired so many legs in the past that this will be a walk in the park. We just need a pair of fine tweezers and some sort of magnification and we are good to go. Within a few seconds, the bent leg of the chip was a problem of the past. And the second thing we need to do is to solder memory sockets to the card for an additional 2MB of memory. The Tsang ET6000 uses unique MD RAM, also known as Multibank DRAM. When I saw a seller in Poland offering those chips on a classifieds website, I asked a friend to get them for me. And now I have three of those memory chips, each with one megabyte. We only need two for this card, but it is never a bad idea to have a spare in case one is faulty. Before we start with the modification, let's quickly test the card to verify it actually works. And the Tsang ET6000 shows up and reports 2MB of video memory. Great! We can now go ahead with a memory upgrade. I do not want to solder the memory chips directly to the card, because it would limit my ability to use them on other cards. Luckily, I found the correct memory sockets needed for this type of memory some time ago. But first let's remove the excess solder applied by the factory from the solder pads. When the pads are clean, it is much easier to place and align the sockets on the card. Flux and solder wick are your friends. And after cleaning up, I applied another round of flux to the pads. That will make soldering the sockets a lot easier. Flux will also help to keep the sockets in place while we are working on them. And then we can start soldering the socket pins to the card. Since I have two ET6000, I decided to add sockets to both. If I ever find another MD RAM chip, the second card can get an upgrade as well. And now we can install the memory in the sockets for this card to become a Tsang ET6000 with 4MB of video memory. When you are looking for a memory upgrade for those cards, make sure to buy the same type of memory you already have on the card. I have read that mixing different types, for example MD908 and MD909, will not work. I waited until I found the correct chips for my card, which now should be upgraded to 4MB and is ready to be tested. And we get a picture with the ET6000 reporting 4 megabytes of onboard video memory. The first part of this project is complete and we can now focus on our CPU, the Cyrex 5X86. I have two of those CPUs, so we will fix both of them today. 
Luckily, the pins are by far not as bad as they were on both Intel DX2 CPUs. But one of the CPUs has some weird discoloration on the pins. It looks like corrosion, but those pins are supposed to be gold plated. There shouldn't be any corrosion on them. I don't know what this is, but all I can say is that white vinegar did not have any effect on the discoloration. The second CPU on the other hand has very clean pins. So I wonder what the other CPU went through to be in such a condition. So let me go ahead and start straightening those pins. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this CPU from Cyrex is based on the core of a 6x86 CPU developed for the Socket 7 platform. Borrowing from a later design gives this CPU some special abilities that are usually not available on other competing products. The only other CPU that possesses special features is, to my knowledge, the Pentium Overdrive, which uses a heavily modified Pentium core adjusted for Socket 3. Cyrex followed a similar approach and modified a later generation to be compatible with this older platform. Unfortunately, most, if not all, performance enhancing features of this CPU were intentionally disabled due to potentially stability threatening bugs which were not fixed before Cyrex released this CPU to the market. By default, the Cyrex CPU will most likely not perform any better than a regular 486 CPU from Intel or AMD clocked at a similar frequency. Fortunately, there are tools available that will unlock the full potential of this CPU, and we will try this once the pins of those CPUs are straight. Apparently, Cyrex's official website advertised the special abilities of their CPU, including the branch prediction feature, which we now know was disabled by default. This was especially problematic because the marketing material and benchmark numbers released to the public were generated with those features enabled. With better performance in most applications than an Intel Pentium processor clocked at 75MHz, the Cyrex 5x86 filled a gap by providing a decent processor option for Socket 3 motherboards. However, this marketing stunt may have been partially responsible for the CPU's incredibly short lifespan of only 6 months. Another reason for its short time on the market is attributed to the fact that the 6x86 was about to launch and Cyrex did not want to have their own products competing with each other. And just like that, we have restored two more CPUs. The pins are straight again. Before we do the drop in socket test, I want to tell you about my experience working on the pins of those Cyrex CPUs. I did not like them as much as pins of Intel or AMD CPUs. They felt different to work on and were somehow weaker compared to the other CPUs. My method of straightening pins still worked very well, but it wasn't as enjoyable. I wonder if some of those pins might have snapped off if they were in poorer condition. But now, let's move on to the socket tests. Did you really expect anything else? Both CPUs fall perfectly into the socket. And the good news is, both CPUs work. Hardware info lets us know that the Cyrex CPU is a model with stepping 1 in revision 3. This is going to be important later, when we are going to enable the special features of this CPU. In the BIOS under chipset features setup, a new option is available. Unlike with the Intel DX2 CPUs, we get to choose the CPU's internal cache strategy by flipping a value in the BIOS. That will make testing this CPU a lot easier. Let's examine this CPU using a similar method to the one we have used for both Intel DX2 CPUs. First, let's see how the turbo mode affects performance using the different level 1 cache strategies. In Norton system information, both cache strategies result in a score of around 131.5 points with the turbo mode off. When Turbo is engaged, however, the write back strategy is superior, scoring 262.7 points versus 197.1 points when the CPU's level 1 cache is limited to write through mode. In Top Bench, write through scores 203 points without Turbo and 286 points with Turbo engaged. Once we set the CPU to write back for its level 1 cache, the score remains unchanged at 308 points, regardless of the Turbo setting. This behavior is identical to the Intel DX2 CPU with write back cache. Unlike the Intel CPUs where the write through model outperformed the write back model when Turbo was on, the Cyrex delivers frame rates in Doom one would expect. 
The CPU configured with write-through cache scores 23 and 32.6 frames per second when switching between turbo off and on. When the write-back cache is activated, the results increase to 30 and 34.6 frames per second respectively. In the PC Player benchmark, the write-back cache slows down the performance a lot more when turbo is disabled. With a score of 8.1 frames per second, the write-back model is over 3 frames slower than the write-through model at 11.2 frames per second. When we enable turbo mode, both cache strategies score above 15 frames per second, with the write-back cache outperforming the write-through cache by a small margin. But now, let's have a look at the special features the CPU brings to the table. By default, those features are turned off. To unlock the full potential of the CPU, we need a tool that can override some of the internal registers. I am using the tool 5x86 from Peter Moss, in combination with a batch file I wrote to easily set the registers. For simplicity, I will focus on four settings only, which promise the most in terms of performance gain. Furthermore, the CPU is now permanently running in turbo mode. The first feature we will enable is the branch prediction. This was the feature Cyrex promoted on their website, but was switched off in the final product. The score and system information increases from 262 to 278 points, a gain of around 6%. Top bench increased marginally from 308 to 311 points. And Doom also benefits from the branch prediction feature by rendering over one additional frame per second, which is an improvement of almost 4%. PC Player, on the other hand, did not improve by much just 0.1 frames per second faster compared to the CPU with branch prediction switched off. Let's switch on the next feature, Memory Management Unit Reordering. Now the CPU operates with two improvements active. In System Information, the score increases slightly by one tenth of a point to 278.3 points. In Top Bench, the CPU scores now 318 points, an improvement of 7 points compared to the CPU with just branch prediction enabled. Doom is again faster and is now rendering at 36.6 frames per second, which means another extra frame added compared to the previous test. And PC Player also improves by half a frame, which is now finalizing at 16 frames per second. The other two features I wanted to enable should have improved the floating point unit and bypass memory reads. Unfortunately, those two flags did not improve the numbers any further. Quake may have shown a better performance using the floating point improvements, but this benchmark was not part of the tests I have chosen for today. For testing Tomb Raider, however, I will switch on all the flags recommended by a user on Vogons, who did incredible work analyzing this CPU from Cyrix. And this is the moment when it becomes important to know what stepping and revision your CPU has. There are recommendations on how to set the flags depending on your CPU model, your motherboard chipset, and if you use the CPU in DOS or Windows. Both of my CPUs are stepping 1 revision 3, and we will be running in DOS mode. Now it is finally time to start Tomb Raider and see if the game benefits from this CPU clocked at 100 MHz, with most optimizations enabled that Cyrex has put in this chip, but disabled by default. From the moment we start the game, we can tell that it seems to be running smoothly. It is at least a much better experience compared to the DX2 CPUs clocked at 66 MHz. I think we are a big step closer to run this game at an acceptable frame rate on the Socket 3 platform. How much of an improvement we get from the special features of this CPU is difficult to say, but I wouldn't be surprised if the performance gains are somewhere between 10 and 15%. The first level in the Snow Covered Tomb performs quite well. However, I wouldn't say that it runs as smoothly throughout the entire map. In larger areas, you will notice a slowdown of the graphics engine. There are just too many objects to render as it seems. That probably also means that you will face an unpleasant time in later levels. Nevertheless, the first level was enjoyable to play, despite the slowdowns here and there. So, is the game playable with this CPU? Considering that the level design gets a lot more complex later on, I would say no. As you can see here in the scene with the T-Rex, larger areas are still a challenge for the CPU.
I also tested the larger resolution, but as you might have already guessed, it is not playable. Although it does render a bit faster compared to the DX2 CPUs, it remains a slideshow. So we still need something with more power. We could try to overclock the Cyrex CPU to 120MHz if we are lucky and the chip works at that frequency, but I doubt that this would give us the performance needed to run this game smoothly in each situation. In the next video we are going to use the highest clocked 486 CPU I have in my collection, an AMD X5 133ADY, provided I can restore the CPU. This CPU has the worst bent pins I have seen so far. You may have participated in the community post where I asked how many pins I will break off in an attempt to restore this CPU. And most of you said zero. I am not so sure about that, but we will find out in the next video. And then we will see if the AMD CPU, which claims to have a Pentium rating of 75, is capable of delivering passable frame rates throughout the game. And once we are done with this CPU, we will test all CPUs again, with a 3DFX Voodoo card from Diamond Multimedia, which is also in need of some TLC. And this is all I have for you today. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.